This is a unique podcast exploring the criminal justice system and those involved and affected. We'll educate and expose the public as well as potential jurors to what takes place behind the scenes of those who are facing the system. Your host owns a litigation support firm called Justice Technology Professionals, and he works on criminal and civil cases offering support to defendants and counsel. What you're about to hear is an open dialogue opening the minds to the public to what takes place in reality as opposed to what you think takes place ladies and gentlemen welcome to the justice tech pros podcast here's your host dominic crea hello listeners hope everybody's doing well uh, it's been a while since I've done a uh, Justice Tech Pros episode, uh, about four weeks now. I uh, just haven't had the time, and also um, I haven't really thought of any uh, topics that I just want to cover right now. I have notes and stuff, but nothing in depth. Of I usually like to try to get it uh, really detailed when I'm looking to cover something. So I'll take notes, and then I'll do research on it and whatnot. So I haven't really done any of that. Uh, today's episode is going to be a little different. It's really not going to cover any specific topic. I just figured it'd be good, a little something uh, unique on this podcast where I'd connect with the uh, listeners in the sense that I'll give a little bit of background of how everything came to be as far as the podcast, as far as um, the Guilt for the Guiltless book, which was actually an article first. Uh, I spoke a little bit about that, but I'll get a little bit in detail. And uh, I, I guess just whatever pops into my head. So I don't know if this is going to be a long one or a short one. I guess it depends how we go. I'm going to kind of just wing it on thoughts and things uh, that I wanted to talk about. And I was just uh, sitting back and just reflecting on, I'll be coming up on three years where I had my podcast going. And, you know, as time goes by, you almost forget why you got involved in something or what was the purpose or how it developed you just lose track of that how things came to be sometimes because you it's just not really something on your mind you know so those memories kind of fade away to you look at something that reminds you and then then it all comes rushing back and uh one thing i wanted to touch on that that actually caused me to go a little bit down memory lane is uh i don't know for those keeping track um there's been some developments on the informant front, I guess you would call it. Um, John Panisi uh, was a topic of late. I was I reposted episode 73 that I had done, which talks about uh, the informant John Panisi, and I laid out just some things about his character and his persona and some of the um, uh, uh, information that was applicable to himself and others, and, and things he may have done, lies he may have told, things like that. And one of the issues was um, whether or not uh, an issue had rose a while back in one of John's, I, I believe it was his first case he testified on, and the issue uh, rose whereas he hit his um, girlfriend, and he, and he knocked some of her teeth out, and it was in the court records. I'm not going to get into all that. I, I explain all that on, on episode 73, and I explain why I conclude the way I did, that I personally believe the victim. So anyway, um, the author of Guilt for the Guiltless, Lisa Babick, she, um, as time went by, and I guess she did you know, further research and whatnot, she just felt she had a change of opinion, which I've said it a million times. There's nothing wrong in that. I know people... Um, some people, I guess, they get upset if somebody changes their opinion, changes their stance. I have a different look on it. Everybody's entitled to what they do. It's all about reading the information, uh, going through it. And listen, you change your mind, you change your mind. But that's really not the point of this. The point of, of, of this episode is just um, I noticed a, a comment in the retraction. You know, she made a, a retraction just given her uh, point of view and why she felt uh, she no longer believed that John Panisi... Uh, committed domestic abuse but during that uh comment she made a comment about the uh, guilt for the guiltless and it said that it was along the lines and i'm paraphrasing uh that her partner or a colleague told her not to do the book and 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 it wasn't a book let me rephrase that. it was an article so it told her not to work on the article or the project and i'll get into how it you know became a book but it was an article at the time 
And that struck me a little peculiar because it wasn't the way I remembered it. And I, and I didn't know. I Honestly, I just didn't remember. I always dealt with um, Lisa going back and forth as uh, this was developing. I never, I never spoke to her partner or a colleague uh, that helps her. I believe they have websites and, and YouTube channel and stuff they work on. So I, I never had any interaction with him. So I, I, I didn't know. I didn't remember that. So I decided to go back to the first correspondence and kind of how that whole began, how it all, the project actually became one that um, Lisa wanted to work on and uh, her colleague wanted to work on. So I went back to the original email and actually the original email was, it was February 19th of 2020. It's crazy. I, actually, I would have thought it was before that. I really did. I didn't realize it was only two years ago. Uh, I don't know why. I just, I would have thought it was before that, but time get, gets away from you. But anyway, I looked it up, and then I remembered what happened was um, they had a website. It was called ItalianInquisition.com. It was a real good website, and I came across it. They were writing articles on different, like, things that go on that are not just and not fair. And one of the articles was about an individual I remember. Um, the cop, the uh, FBI was trying to violate this the person. I believe he was on uh, home confinement awaiting trial, and he took his daughter to the doctor and one of the FBI agents secretly snapped a picture of him trying to say the guy was on his phone. Uh, long story short, he wasn't on his phone. They, they proved that they didn't violate him. But it was just, like, ridiculous. They followed him to his daughter's uh, doctor appointment and snapped a picture of him. And I remember at the time, we were talking about it. It was just crazy. And I was happy to see at the uh, when this came out, uh, Lisa covered it. And uh, she pointed out, like, how ridiculous that is, you know? Like, they're going and taking pictures of... Uh, somebody at the doctor's office. So when I read that article, I was like, wow, these people really see the bigger picture here. And I dropped, um, I didn't know Lisa at the time. I just dropped, and I don't even think her name was on the website that we use an MS, I believe. And so I dropped this MS an email, just pretty much saying like, great article. I like what you guys are doing. And then, um, MS responds, which later on it was Lisa, uh, thanking me for my feedback. And they offered to, interview me in the first email they wanted to do an interview about my podcast they heard my podcast and they wanted to talk about it and then I was just reading the chain and I mentioned in the chain uh being there they're writing about um unjust things and things going on in the system that are corrupt or uh, working in a way that does not line up with with how it should work they were focusing on that so when I saw that and I responded I told them they should take a look at my father's case just to see. And this, yeah, I didn't even say anything about writing about it or anything like that. I just pretty much said, if you want to be shocked by what goes on in the system, look at this case. I could send you some snapshots of um, the motions and things submitted. And so it developed from there and we went back and forth. And um, I'll get into that a little bit. But the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this, when I seen the comment that said her colleague didn't want her to do it. I was like, wow, that's weird. Let me go see if that was said in the emails because I know my personality. See, my personality is like, I only like to deal with people that are 100% into something, um, just the way I am. So I know myself and I was thinking, I was like, wow, if if that was conveyed to me, that somebody was uncomfortable with it, I, I would have killed the whole project. I would have said, yeah, don't worry about it. I appreciate it. You know, I'm, um, it is what it is. You're just not comfortable with it. So I found it odd that I didn't say that. So I started looking at the emails. And the reason I didn't say it, when I was reading the emails, that was never um, told to me that her partner didn't want anything to do with it, told her not to do the project. Along those lines, if you read her retraction, I believe it's on her channel and uh, possibly the websites that they have. I don't know. Um, but it was something along those lines. And it, it, that's, I, that was never told to me. The email I actually have says how the... Um, uh, I, I want to use the right terminology. It says that the colleague was very passionate about the subject. So that, that's really the only feedback I got. And then I got a few more feedbacks from the, uh, her partner, and it was all pretty much um, positive. You know, it was like, oh, there's an interesting story. We're going to work. There was nothing that showed me anyway that uh, her partner didn't want her writing it because, again, like I said, I would have said, don't write it. Don't, you know, I appreciate you looking into it. If it's not for you, no problem. So I just found that comment odd. I don't know what I missed there, but I didn't see that at all. So, I mean, if they felt they shouldn't write it, then you know, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I guess 
okay. It is what it is, right? Things change. But, um, so I want to get into how that developed. So I was reading just to remind myself, because I forget too, so many things going on. So I was just reading how it developed, and it was a matter of me, you know, sending court documents and things like that, and Lisa and I going back and forth. And then um, Lisa wrote a phenomenal article. Uh, one thing has nothing to do with the other. We may disagree now on certain issues. Uh, that's irrelevant to me. The, the facts are the facts. She wrote a phenomenal article. It brought a lot of um, attention to the case. And, I, and I'll always be forever grateful for, uh, for that. Regardless of uh, personalities or personal issues and things like that, uh, that may change relationships. That's just how it goes. Uh, but as far as that project... I thought it was a phenomenal job. I thought she dug in. Um, I remember sending a massive amount of information, dockets. I mean, it's a a huge undertaking. So people don't realize what it takes to go through that stuff. And it was a lot. And it was a lot of going back and forth. And then when all was said and done, uh, for those who aren't familiar, I'm talking about the Guilt for the Guiltless book. But at the time, that's not what it was called. It was just an article. Uh, They put it up on the Italian Inquisition site. And then... um, uh, I suggested the name Guilt for the Guiltless, and that was the uh, title. And to myself, when I saw the article, I was like, wow, this is phenomenal. Uh, more people should be aware of this. And I actually recommend this for families. You know, if you see articles and pieces of work that really dive into to subjects you care about, maybe something similar, you know, maybe something uh, was done on, on a family member, unfortunately, who may have been part of the uh, legal system, and they did a really... A good job, similar to how uh, Miss Babick did, and went through the case and really uh, put out all the documents, put out all the court information. You know, if you get something like that, you can't just let it die out and and go out into the uh, into the abyss. It's about bringing attention to it, right? It's uh, whenever you see like uh, these stories that we all hear about, like that Tiger King whack job, you know, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, on Netflix, that murder documentary, damn it, I can't remember it, but th- there was a guy for murder, uh, I, give me one second, I gotta look it up, cause that'll kill me, okay, I had to look that up, cause that was bothering me, Making a Murderer, remember that, um, that was on Netflix, and it, it bringing attention, and then people start to look at the case, so, obviously I knew no uh, documentary was gonna be made, But I saw the article and it was phenomenal. So I figured, how can this get more exposure? Get more exposure to the book, uh, to the article. Get more exposure to the person who wrote it. And really just have people read it and see what they think. So what I did was I took the article. And I'm glad I did because the website's not around no more. So this this work would have just been lost. And that would have been the end of it. And maybe some people want that. But I don't know. I don't know. uh, For me, I did what was in... uh, what I felt was in the best interest of getting it the most exposure and the the proper um, the proper eyes looking at it, uh, having the the public see it. I wanted to bring as much attention as possible. Obviously, for 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 the reasons that it was a story written about my father's case, where I feel, and I believe any logical person reading it would feel he didn't get a, a, a fair trial. Uh, and that's that's all one could ask for. You just want a fair trial. So I wanted to bring as much attention to it as possible. So I took that article. I then had to send it to um, an ebook editor because when you write something out, it's totally different than ebook format. You know, you have to have it reformatted. You got to put links in it, uh, picture uh, pictures in it, graphics, things like that. So that was a project in of itself. I had to find somebody to do that. I hired somebody. Uh, we put the book together. Um, designed the cover, things like that, and made it a full-blown ebook. And then I decided a lot of people, especially nowadays, they like to listen to audio books. So I figured, let me do that as well. I then looked out. I hired somebody who does that for a living. They narrate audio books. I hired him to read it. And I turned, turned it from an article that was on a website that's no longer around to a book that's in uh, Barnes & Noble's online, Smashwords online, all over the place. I I uploaded it to a million websites. I mean, everywhere you could think of for free. Never wanted to make money on it. It's not about that. Uh, Smash words, you could charge per download. None of that. It's always been free. So people could just listen to it and decide what they think, read the uh, information, and go from there. Now, a lot of people tried saying it was propaganda. I don't know. I don't even know what that means as far as... So, in other words, if a... uh, 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 
journalist at the time approaches you and wants to write something that's propaganda, that's news to me. But anyway, so that's how it came to develop, and I, and I, and I was very uh, proud of it. I thought it was a, a great, um, I thought it came out phenomenal. Um, I thought the, uh, I built the website for it, guiltforthegiltless.com, just to, to really get the word out. Oh, I even put a press release out um, about Lisa writing the book. And, in, and a, a few websites picked up on it, a few articles. And actually, somebody wrote on a, blo a blog. I had somebody write on a blog about Lisa as an author and, and her background and why she wrote the book. So I did as much as I could to promote it, put it out there. And, and just on that note, for family members that maybe need to get the word out there on a wrongful conviction or on an injustice, it's important to really capitalize on what you can and try to just get the people to see it because you're not always going to get the Netflix to step in and bring attention and then you have people advocating. You're not always going to get that. So you have to work with what you could get. You're not always going to have a making a murderer, a murderer uh, documentary. You know, you're not going to always have that. And so you got to try to work with what you can if, if, if you want to go down that route and really try to help out somebody you care about and whatnot. So I always recommend never really letting those things just stay on a website. If it's on there, just take it down and have it. And I actually think I still have the original article. That'll be that'll be interesting. Maybe I'll pull that up and just show what it... Not the whole article because they got the ebook, obviously. But I'll just pull up the original article just to maybe show what it looked like. It was it's just cool to see how it developed. And so, um, you know, that's really pretty much the story of that. That's how the book came to be. That's where it's at. And again, like I said, do I kid myself that... The appellate court's going to read the book and be like, oh, that's it. We're overturning the case. Of course not. It's not about that. It's about really just bringing attention to what goes on because a lot of people are just not aware of what goes on. So if you show them different cases uh, like Making a Murderer and all these different uh, uh, documentary, I think there was one called Innocent Man on Netflix. You know, there's a lot of things that go on. I don't got to tell you people. You always see as... as um, on different media outlets when there's a case of injustice you see what goes on to bring attention to it so you got to try to do that the best you can and then what happened was i want to get into a little bit of uh, how the podcast started you know so what happened was unfortunately the trial this is now flashing back because the book came after the podcast so flashing back um this is prior to the correspondence i had with um <clears throat> ms or or lisa this is prior to that. In uh, 2019 is when the uh, my father, uh, Christopher Londonio, Matthew Madonna, and Terrence Caldwell were hit with a uh, guilty verdict. Um, so you can imagine the frustration to family, defense team, when you're not able to fight the case that you want to fight, you're not able to submit what you want to submit, and you're not able to expose what you want to expose. So I decided... What's the small part I could do? And it's probably, it's probably at that time anyway, it was probably ser served as a form of therapy, you know, just to have an outlet to vent about it and talk about it. So I started the podcast. I was like, ah, let me give it a shot, see what it's about. It was never really my thing. Uh, it wasn't something I even wanted to do. I was approached a while ago about doing a uh, entrepreneur podcast with a partner I have in another uh, business. And I just wasn't into it, you know, it just wasn't my thing. But as we all know, sometimes events in your life kind of change a little bit. You have to go outside your comfort zone. Uh, if, if you're focusing on a bigger picture, you have to go outside your comfort zone. And that's what I did. Uh, I went outside my comfort zone and uh, started putting out the podcast. And the main purpose of the podcast, if you go through it, it wasn't, and it's still not talking about my father's case, my father, that's really not what it's about. Uh, I've maybe did a handful of episodes on, on the case. It's really just about the overall picture, and that's what I wanted to present to the audience. I just wanted to give an overall picture of what goes on, all different instances. And I've interviewed different people. If you go through the episodes, I've interviewed uh, uh, various individuals who have unfortunately been at the wrong end of the justice system where... Um, they were being accused of something they didn't do or whatnot. So if you go through my catalog, you'll see a couple of those interviews. I interviewed an attorney who was wrongfully convicted, uh, things like that. 
And um, I also brought in on, it was important to me, after dealing with that trial, it was important to me, I wanted to focus on things that I felt was important for defense teams to be aware of. Uh, things to, because we were working with different defense teams. When you have several defendants in a case, you have different defense teams all part of it. And you get personalities that clash. You have different ideas that some make the grade, some don't. So I, I, I wanted to kind of talk about those things. And um, experts was huge on my mind. So I did a lot of videos about how important having an expert for the defense is, regardless of what it is, uh, if it's related to forensics, or it's an audio video thing, um, anything that requires a rebuttal expert witness, cell site, cell site's huge, cell site technology, anything that requires, when you see the government putting in an expert, the defense always wants, the defense should always put in a rebuttal expert. Sometimes they don't. And I think that's a huge mistake. So I did a lot of episodes on that. I tried to cover things that, let's say if I was in that position, I would want my defense team to think of and work on. So that's what I try to cover. Now, again, everybody has different strategies. I don't give legal advice. I give my opinion. I give um, information on experience, things that of, of what I believe work and don't work, and the best path for certain things. So I try to elaborate on different topics every time I do a podcast. Today, I just kind of wanted to wing it and talk about the overall picture of it. So... Yeah, about three years ago, I started pumping out the podcast, promoting them. I spoke about how I grew it as well. I went in, uh, uh, I know everybody looks at the different communities and they feel they're in uh, one community and they're locked in. And I spoke about how that's really not true. I made a post about it because when I started out, I was in the criminal justice um, community and I'm still there. I try to keep my, my foot in a lot of different communities. That's how you get different subscribers. You can't just limit yourself. I was active on Facebook. I opened up a Facebook group actually called USA Sub for Sub. Uh, it was a group where anybody with a channel could join it and you all agree to sub to one another and talk about your channel. And at the time I had it based in the USA. I just felt it was more geared. What I was talking about was the United States justice system. So it, I didn't think anybody across the, you know, across the globe would be interested in that. But I was wrong. Uh, there's a lot of people and I was happy about that. There's people from all over the world who were just interested in it because the overall concept exists everywhere. It may be different um, as far as how it plays out uh, procedural, uh, legal-wise. It may be different structure-wise in the United States than other countries, but other countries all experience wrongful convictions, lying informants, uh, misconduct, prosecutorial misconduct, judge bias, jury bias, all, all countries could relate to that. So I was happy and I, and I didn't think of that originally and I was a little disappointed in myself. When I started that Facebook group, I should have just made it a global group. But anyway, that was nice to see that it really is a global issue and that kind of doesn't put a ceiling on what I could talk about because I am reaching out throughout the whole globe so I could fill people in on different things, different insight. The channel's growing so people must enjoy the content. Although people who aren't crazy about me, all the uh, all the informant supporters, I said it before, they say uh, it's boring. So I, I don't know. I guess they find it boring. Uh, but um, I try again. It's not the most entertaining. I get it. It's not something you're gonna laugh and enjoy yourself. But I believe it's information that's important. It's important for jurors. It's important for future jurors. It's important for the public. So that's why I keep doing it. And who knows? One day may come, and I just may not do it no more. I may just. Uh, not do the podcast no more. You never know. You never know. It all depends on where the project ends. I like to end projects out and not just quit midstream. So I'd want it to have accomplished something. So that's that's really how I'm going to um, tread. I'm just going to see what's accomplished. So I started doing that. Two years in, I'd say. Yeah, about two years into the podcast, I came across uh, another podcast called Mob Rats Exposed. And this individual, for those who aren't familiar, he focuses on all um, informants that are related to organized crime. And the majority of them are on YouTube. So he focuses on that and exposing them and pointing out their lies and whatnot. So I saw that and I spoke about this a little bit. I'm not going to go into do too much depth on how we push back began. But anyway, I saw that. I saw a few other channels popping up. I uh, started interacting with people in, in a certain genre. It was a new genre for me. 
I started interacting with people, formed a few nice relationships, and then that's how the whole We Push Back thing came together. I figured I'd build a hub. Uh, everybody, whereas they're bringing attention to issues that are important, they're bringing attention to uh, uh, people were talking about guilt for the guiltless. They were bringing attention for that. And I wanted to also show appreciation for that. So I figured I'd do a hub. Everybody helps each other. Everybody gets exposure. But I'm not going to get too much into that. That's more for the We Push Back channel. For those who aren't aware of it, go to WePushBack.com. It'll give you a full understanding of what I'm talking about. And if you go to the WePushBack.com YouTube channel, you go through each episode, you'll really get an idea of how things develop and what's going on. I try to make that channel really condensed about what's going on in the We Push Back community and things going on when We Push Back. And I have a, I'll be doing an episode on that channel soon because I have a few things that I spoke about that I was working on but I just didn't get to. But I'm going to start rolling out soon about hats and billboards and things like that. But I'll talk about that on the other channel. You know, it's all about time, right? You, you got to allocate your time properly and prioritize. So what's funny is I, I was taking a step back and I was thinking about how the atmosphere was a year and a half ago before we pushed back, before uh, content creators were pretty much standing up saying, hey, you know what? We don't believe these lying informants. And if you look back to those old episodes, go a year and a half back on all these informant podcasts and you start reading the comments back then, you'll see they never got any questions. They never got anybody saying, well, how do we know that's true? Nobody guessing whatever they were uh, talking about. Everybody pretty much just eating up everything they said as if it was gospel. Now you come to current times and you go in those same comment sections of these informants. It's a different story. You see people questioning it. Uh, just look at We Push Back, how it's grown. We went from, it was, I just thought it was going to be me, to be honest with you. And uh, Mob Rats exposed at the time. And then Kane Shades uh, joined. But I, I didn't have much uh, faith it was going to grow. Now we're up to 23, 24 uh, people, to 24 uh, content creators. So I think what happened is a lot of people started coming out of the woodwork almost saying, hey, you know what? I don't agree with lying informants. This shouldn't be a thing. This shouldn't be a wave of a new society where everybody's okay with somebody telling on somebody else to avoid accountability. Excuse me, I'm taking a sip of my coffee. You know, I think a lot of people came together based on that on that concept, and it allowed a lot of individuals to have a voice. They felt comfortable because a year and a half ago, they would have come out with that. Uh, they would have been on an island, a complete island. I mean, if you just read the comments from all these informant podcasts, my Lord, it was just pretty much everything they said. Oh, you're right. You're the best. You know? <laughs> it was crazy. And don't get me wrong. They still have a massive following. Um, the We Push Back community will always be the minority here. Uh, people just don't see it that way. A lot of people just see it that, you know, if you get in trouble, give up whoever you can to get out of trouble. That's just how they see it. That's society. And a lot of people see it. I deal with it all the time, right? How many times have I talked about it? People try to say, oh, uh, they're bad men. And, and Dominic's just trying to free bad men. All the ignorant comments, all the moronic comments. I've seen comments like they're not helping nobody. Those are people who are so far out of the loop. You see, they just can't relate. It's just a different culture, different upbringing, different set of standards. They believe everything the government says. They believe everything an informant says. They, they believe all that. They don't want to hear nothing else. Even if you try to show them facts and you try to show them information that is to the contrary, they'll just close their eyes, stick their fingers in their ear and make a sound so they don't hear nothing or see anything. And, and that's life. You're going to have those type of people. I appeal to the more open-minded individual, and I enjoy that. I enjoy when I when I talk to someone and I show them facts, and they start to see things like, hey, it's not what I originally thought. They're open-minded, and they start changing opinions. And I always say, I'm not here to change anyone's opinion. If they choose to do that, that's phenomenal. I will never force you to change your opinion. I'll never try to jam the way I think down your throat. I'll say what I have to say, and that's it. I'm perfectly fine with saying, okay, you see it your way, I see it my way. No problem, no harm, no foul. But when you're able to have an intelligent conversation and you're able to, to lay things out and, and put out a clear picture of what goes on and you have members of the public who are just unaware who then start to write you and email you. I've even had a, a recent member. 
he was he was really entrenched, not entrenched, I don't even like to use that word. He was really involved, let's just say, with a lot of the informant podcasts, talking to them, interacting with them. And he sent an email to me basically saying that he now sees their true colors. He sees he sees a lot of what I was talking about playing out. And I like things like that. That shows me that the truth will rise to the top. See, because it doesn't matter what you try to force down somebody's throat. An intelligent person is going to read everything, understand everything, and then decide for themselves. So if you're trying to advocate for something that's so way out there they can't relate to, they're just not going to see it your way. But if you just lay out the facts and you're not trying to jam things down somebody's uh, throat, I hate to keep saying the same friggin' sentence, uh, a sentence, but I just mean if you're not trying to force your opinion or your will on somebody else and you let them just analyze everything, you're going to get some people who will come out of it saying, oh yeah, you know what, I see what you're saying, I see what you're trying to explain to me, and you'll get some people just say, nah, I don't see it that way, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, but you've gained people, you understand, you've gained people, you're on a platform now where you're, you're able to talk to the public, you're able to relate to the public, and you're gaining followers, viewers, subscribers, whatever you want to call them. You're just gaining people that now have a similar perspective as you do. Now, are you all going to think exactly the same way? Of course not. But you're starting to form a bond on a foundation, on an ideology. And, and that's, a, that's a good bond to have. You could always build a relationship based on that. And have we seen on here, relationships come and go. And there's some people, they started out, you know, they, they go back and forth. One day they agree with the informants, one day they don't, one day they do. And you know what that is? For me, something like that, you got to just sit back. Let them, let them go through those motions. Let them go back and forth and then see where they wind up settling up. Where are they going to finalize after they see both sides of everything? After they deal with the lying informants, after they deal with the people who are against the lying informants? after they read the information, after they understand the information, where are they going to wind up? And that's what you got to look at. Too often on YouTube, I see people come out, they'll do like one or two podcasts, they'll say something, say I agree with, something that I'm like, ah, oh, that's a good podcast. But too many times you'll get uh, other content creators, they, they look to embrace them right away, thinking that they're on the same page, the same ideology, and then a day or two later, they'll say something or do something that totally contradicts it, and you're like, what the heck? That's why I always like to take a step back, let people do their thing, and then I see where they're at. And I especially started doing that more on the We Pushback side because, um, you know, we had a member who was in and uh, he started <laughs> he started off one way, you know, all gung-ho, and then he switched the other way, and now he just, he bad mouths We Pushback and all that. So to myself, I just kind of said, let me... Uh, take a little bit of a different approach sometimes where you got to sit back before I even consider somebody being a wee pushback member. I got to really analyze it a little bit. And if they were back and forth, you can't always look to embrace them right away if they come back uh, on this side. And again, I'm not saying crucify the person. I'm not saying tell them, oh, well, you're flip-flop. I'm not saying that at all. There's nothing wrong in people t changing their opinion. That's how it goes. It's like I said with that situation with... Um, uh, uh, the writer uh, Lisa Babic, when she, you know, she changed her opinion on um, whether or not she believed John Panisi committed domestic abuse. Nothing wrong in that. That's how it goes. Um, we had a back and forth on my channel. I said my point of view. She said her point of view in the comments. That's how it goes. Different ways of looking at it. Different. We have different uh, factors that we need to make a decision. For me, I look at different elements than she may look at to make a decision. It's just how it goes. So it goes back to what I'm saying. Sometimes you get people who change their mind, and there's nothing wrong in that. There may be somebody who, who comes around and says, you know what, I was looking at something a little differently. I see it now your way. And it's good just to, you get along, but I believe time is what's going to really be the true test. You got to let time go by. You got to see how they react, how they respond. If they have a fight, what we all see too often, right? Say, say you have a community and people are getting along and then one person fights with a member in that community, that's it. Well, you know, they just go nuts. They start abusing everybody, abusing, you know. So you got to keep an eye out for that. How do people handle adversity? How do they handle um, a fight? I've had many disagreements with different members of We Push Back. We've had disagreements. I may see things one way. They may like somebody I don't like. 
But that has no bearing. I don't care. I wouldn't turn on them for that. And like, oh, you piece of garbage. You like this person. Like, it's not my business who they like. I don't, I don't get into that. And I'm also the type of guy. And, and trust me, I, I, I could have, uh, if I wasn't the type of guy, I could have did things a lot differently. But I'm the type of guy, even if I have a fight with somebody and I never talk to them again, I'm not going to go on this crusade of bashing them airing out their like personal information, whatever they may have told me in privacy. I don't know. To me, that's really, <laughs> I don't do things like that. That's, that's not even on my radar. For my concern, if I don't deal with you no more, I just don't deal with you no more. That's it. It doesn't matter what we talked about in the past. That doesn't matter. I don't go down that road. To me, that's, it's not a, a trait, a character trait that I'm fond of. I, I don't like it. I don't like to deal with people that are capable of that. It's just not for me. So you see a lot of that going on, right? You see people that fight and then boom. Next day, about 10,000 <laughs> snapshots of emails <laughs> and this and that. It's crazy. Somebody called it a soap opera and, and YouTube is a lot like a soap opera. But I'll, I'll tell you what, folks. This is so, social media as a whole. This is just what it's about. Um, I, I spoke about this on one of my episodes. Uh, on Facebook, I like to join a lot of dog groups and a lot of this craziness comes out in dog groups trust me it happened to me i i would use a um pseudonym in the dog groups because i just wanted to learn about dogs you know i wasn't there to talk about anything personal and then um somebody found out who i was in the dog group and they posted all kinds of articles about my pop and my brother all this nasty stuff like nothing to do with dogs just to like uh, go at me because I, I started a big dog group, uh, a breed group. And man, they get very competitive there. <laughs> they like their dog breed groups. Like if you start one and you're talking about things that they don't agree with, geez, they get cutthroat. But in the grand scheme of things, people, does that mean anything? You think I cared? It was a dog group for Facebook. I don't care what they say. Uh, it's social media. But my point is people will say, oh, YouTube's bad. This genre's bad. It's all over the place. It's all over social media. It's just how it is. And that's why me personally, I don't really have any personal social media. My family don't have personal social media. I don't believe in it. Uh, as far as putting all your information out there, sharing your family stuff. I also don't believe in it in safety reasons. You get people that'll be like, oh, we're on vacation for two weeks. And they, they're posting their house and all this. You don't realize that people who were <laughs> looking to burglarize or watching those things to see who's home, who's not home. You got to be very careful. People get way too comfortable sharing their intimate details with strangers. I, I don't know. I just can't relate to that. And I'm not abusing it. Trust me. I'm not abusing those who do it. Maybe it's because I'm cynical or it's because, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just because I, I, I see the worst in people sometimes and I see how they can look at things. You know, I don't like to put little kids on Facebook. I just don't like that. Uh, trust me, I have beautiful children. I'm proud of every one. I have four children. I'm proud of every one of them. My, my two oldest sons are in college. Super proud of them. They, they're on the right path. They're taking classes. They know uh, they're hard workers. They understand the value of a dollar. I, I raised them with old school ways, how to treat how to treat females, how to treat their mother, how to treat their parents, respectful, how to talk to adults, how to respect authority. You got to respect authority, respect the police, always be a respectful person. You know, and uh, so I'm very proud of them. I would love to put their stuff, their achievements, things they do, I'd love to put it all over social media and brag my kids. But it's just not me. I'm not going to put them in the spotlight. I don't, I just don't want that attention. I just don't think it's good atten attention to have. You know, I really don't. And... You have a lot of psychos on um, on the internet. I was watching The Dark Side of Comedy. If you get that on Vice TV, they do this series, Dark Side of. They'll do Dark Side of Wrestling, which I really like. I wasn't even a big wrestling kid, but I just really like watching it. Dark Side of Wrestling, um, Dark Side of Comedy. I think there's Dark Side of the 90s. A lot of, it's on Vice. The reason why I'm bringing that up is I was watching one on Roseanne Barr. You know, when she had that whole fall from grace when she said all those racist statements on Twitter. And uh, they canceled her show. She came back on the, the Roseanne show on Netflix and they wanted to not cancel the show. I think they got rid of her, but whatever. But my point is, the person uh, on, the, on the show that was narrating, they were talking about what a problem it is that people with mental problems 
have mental issues, psychological problems, when they have access to the internet, you know, they're saying a lot of things they that may be off base, that may be nuts and all that, because you can't account for that. You don't know anybody's mental state when they're on the computer. So you don't know what you're dealing with. You may be dealing with somebody who just has psychological problems, but then you may be dealing with somebody who has violent psychological problems. So you have to realize what you're opening yourself up to. You know, in real life, you could read body language, look somebody in the eye, have a conversation, get a feel for what type of person they are before you start talking to them and opening up to them. On the internet, you can't do that. So you don't, there's no filter. You don't know who you're appealing to. You don't know the individuals you're talking to. There's a lot of wackos out there. And, and I believe that's the reason why you have this chaos in social media. Think about it, folks. I know everybody's saying, oh, people get bashed on here, this and that. And trust me, there's a lot of terrible stuff. I'm not minimalizing at all. But I've seen online attacks that escalated to a tragic level. To me, those are tragic. When you see a kid getting bullied, getting tormented on Facebook, perhaps because he's uh, gay and he's getting ripped apart because parents didn't raise their kids right. Me, I blame the parents. I'm sorry, folks, but I blame the parents. What I mean is parents should not be allowing their kid to go on and bully somebody because they're different, because they're gay. Or what. what kind of kid is that? If my kid ever do that, there'd be a serious, serious problem. And I'd be involved in, what are you doing? What, why are you online? And that's a problem, I think. I see it just in my neighborhood. I see it with people my same age with their kids. It's like, it's just different. I, I see it different where they're just pretty much like, all right, do your thing. They're not taking a proactive role. I mean, I, I'm going to be honest. You know how many times, like, my sons maybe have friends over or something, and then it'll be late at night, my younger son, and the friends will have to walk home. You know, they don't drive the younger kids, and they'll look to walk home. And I'll, my wife will drive them home because we're just not comfortable letting their, a kid walk home. And in my head, I'm like, well, where are the parents? Why aren't they picking these kids up? If that was my kid, I'd be picking them up. So I see a lot of that. And I think, unfortunately, especially for children, they could really be tormented online. And the, and the parents just are, of the kids doing the tormented, for some reason, are just unaware of it, which... I can't relate to as a parent because I try to stay involved. I try to know what's going on. I try to be present with my kids. We have uh, family dinners every night. I like to have dinner unless I'm working late and I can't make it. But I like to talk about my kids' day, talk about what's going on. You know, those things are important. And I believe that's being lost a lot in society nowadays. The family connection, the going over um, your morals and how you believe. Because nowadays, let's face it, there's a lot of wokeness, and I'm not into that. Uh, I'm not into that crazy wokeness where everything's a problem, every statement's racist, every statement offends somebody. I, I look deeper than that. I don't look at just throwaway statements or stupid statements or something somebody said which was moronic. I try to understand the person and look a little deeper. I don't right away look to ice somebody out because they may have done or said something that I don't agree with. But nowadays, you see, somebody says one little thing, that's it. They look to cancel them. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, you, you got to be aware of that. And talking about the whole social media thing, what I found interesting today is I was reading in the paper the New York gun permit laws. Starting September 1st, they're going to start requiring that you submit three years of social media to see if you're a person of good character. You know, this goes back to what I was talking about with the jurors, how I felt it's very important they do that with the jurors. They should see their social media. They got to give them all their handles and see what they're about. I think that's more... Don't you think that's, if not more important, just as important as somebody getting a gun permit to know what their, their character is about, if they're of more, good moral character? I don't understand how they don't implement that with jurors. They should require jurors to turn over three years of their social media, see the things they've said. Now, I don't know how they'd be able to track that because, as we know, people use anonymous uh, handles and names and things like that. So they probably won't even be able to track it that accurate, but you could get a good idea what somebody's about. I think that should be a minimal requirement with jury uh, selection. Really look at their um, comments, what they say on social media. For those involved in different genres on here, right? Think about that. Think about the type of people and the comments they leave. And that's your jury pool. And the judge isn't aware of things they talk about, things they say, and that's your jury pool. So all those things really should factor in. 
And what's funny, a lot of these people who judge online, I notice, uh, a lot of the people who are against we push back against myself, if you look at their character, look at their resume, I mean, the majority of them, who's a, a drug addict, who's an ex-drug addict, who is in a psycho ward, who is accused, um, who, who had domestic abuse charges, I mean, it goes on and on. Uh, who is scamming somebody? Who had some kind of scam on YouTube? I mean, they, the charges go on and on. And in my head, I'm like, wow, these are the type of people judging me? <laughs> these, are the, these are the individuals knocking me? You know, I found that funny. They, they're bashing me and judging me. And then you get the morons, oh, he's a gangster's son, all that. Uh, okay, what are you? What have you accomplished in your life? I just... I think social media in general just gives people the freedom to forget who they are, what their character's about, and just judge others. You know, just cast those stones. Even though they're in a solid glass house, they're just throwing those stones. But all I know is I don't have any domestic violence. I don't have any record. I don't, ha I don't have any felonies. I don't have anything like that. As a matter of fact, another requirement should be everybody, uh, a good thing to really source somebody out, look at their LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a professional network. What have they accomplished? What's their resume say? What's their education say? What do their clients have to say about them? What do their respected colleagues have to say about them? I guarantee, folks, you look up a lot of these content creators, go on LinkedIn. Let's see if they have a LinkedIn. They all talk like they've accomplished so much. They're doing so much. Okay, what would you accomplish? Who'd you help? What do your colleagues have to say about you? What do partners have to say about you? What do clients have to say about you? If you're an employee, what does your employer have to say about you? Where's all that? They're so quick to judge everybody else, but yet where are they in their life? And that's what you got to ask yourself. That's why none of this stuff bothers me. I've been dealing with this for years, even before YouTube, just on uh, Facebook. You see stuff about my family. You see stuff about, uh, there's these moronic I call them forum fools. You know, they go into all these sites, like all these organized crime sites, and all they do is talk about people all day. Imagine that. You're just talking about grown men all day and what they did and who did what. You know, you get those morons, these forum fools. They live in all these forums talking about organized crime. Those are the people judging me. Why would I be concerned about that? See that? And I think a lot of people on here, they get too wrapped up and thinking, oh, well, somebody attacked me, I got to attack them back. You have to realize what you're dealing with. You have to look at the whole picture. First off, there's a lot of things being done intentionally. There's a lot of traps being set on here. I've been saying this for three years. If you go to my earliest episodes, and I even predicted what was going to go on with a lot of these informants, if you go back and listen, where they would try to goat people, insult people. They want people to come out of character, see? They want people to say something stupid, make some kind of... Uh, threat without realizing so they could jam them up for that. So I think a lot of content creators don't realize that. They're getting goaded into things on purpose and they're falling for those traps time and time again. See me, I'll come on here if I have something to say. I'll do an episode on it. I'll rebut any lies and I'll move on. I had that issue with mob facts. I explained my side. Now I know that guy just keeps going on and on, but it is what it is. That's his style. He wants to keep going on and on. Let him. The guy don't like me, I don't like him. That's life. There's nothing wrong in that. He's not my type of person. I'm not his. I don't care what he says. His opinions are relevant. So he could go on and on. But what I try to do is I just try to come on, put some information. If I feel somebody is saying... I, I try to more address the lies. You know, I'm not going to address the abuse. People could abuse me. That's how it goes. Uh, people put my picture up. They want to mock me. That's fine. And as I always say, time and time again... I don't take any of them that seriously. They're all full of hot air, air. I'll tell you why. Few people I had issues with. I called them or I emailed them because they didn't want to get on the phone and told them, come to my office, have a cup of coffee, get out all this frustration you have. Tell me what your problem is. They never took me up on that once. So all of these threats, I got threatened by uh, foremans, uh, meet you in a garage. I don't have to meet anybody. I'm at my office six days a week. Just come stop by. You got anything on your mind? I mean, the threats, you know, it's funny. It's comical. It's almost like little kids. I think like when you're in school, right? And you're talking tough and oh, I'm going to beat this. That's not impressive. That's not how men act. That's how insecure males act. Guys 
who really never accomplished anything, people who really don't have any kind of courage because they know they have that buffer of the internet. So they say everything they're feeling because they don't have the guts or the courage to say it to somebody's face directly. Like men deal with things, right? You got a problem with a man, you call him up, hey, come meet me over here, I got to talk to you about something. You get it off your chest. That's how men deal with things. Even in the business world, I've had some intense arguments with clients and things. I go meet them. And like grown men, we settle our differences and we move on. Either we keep the relationship intact and move forward professionally or we sever it and go our separate ways. On here, it's a whole different thing. Everybody talks tough. Everybody's going to do something. I remember I put up a comment a while ago. One of the commenters was saying, we've been looking for Dominic. We're going to find him. <laughs> Where are you looking? What's so hard about looking? Go to the office. 180 South Broadway in White Plains. What's the problem? Why is it this big uh, production? You don't got to look. And here's another thing. You don't got to announce it, people. You got something on your mind. Just do it. Don't announce it. I know a lot of people like to make the show, you know, act tough on here and announce their intentions. One thing I know in life, and this doesn't go for irrational people. You get some lunatics, they, they just spat out the mouth and then they do crazy things. I'm talking about serious people. If somebody had serious intentions, normally you're not going to hear about it. You're just not going to hear about it when somebody's serious. Now, when they're phony, when they're spineless, yeah, they're going to be screaming and yelling and cursing and all that stuff and, and threatening people and making fun of people. And then you get the other thing that happens. You'll get a... I've noticed, especially on YouTube, it happens on Facebook too, you'll, you'll get people who are just bashing somebody day in, day out, ripping them up. And then when the person responds, they're the bad guy. You know, oh, I can't believe you responded. Look, his true colors are coming out of responding. And, well, you've been tormenting this guy for how long? What? And, and he had enough. Some people just, it gets to them. They had enough. I call those the light the fuse people. They light the fuse. And then when it goes off, oh, what did I do? What happened? What did I do? You know, that's that's elementary trick 101. They keep poking, poking, and then when somebody reacts, oh, what did I do? And you, you got to really look at all these things when you're on here, when you're on social media, when you're on YouTube, when you're doing your content. Unfortunately, you have to factor all these things in. You have to factor all these things in, and there's some people that do it the right way. Me, the only mistake I may have made, but I, I can't even say it was a mistake because... Um, I've met a lot of great people. But a lot of content creators, they just do their content and they don't engage with anybody. When they do lives, they don't talk to anybody. They just do their show. They let people in the chat interact. They don't really make themselves accessible. And that could be the smart way to go. You know, it really could. And maybe that's something I should have done initially. Um, it's something I am practicing now, honestly, moving forward because I get a lot of crazy emails. People want to be friends and a lot of... <laughs> a lot of nutty DMs, let me just say, and uh, <laughs> things that are just crazy. But I just, I, I don't even respond to them. I actually, a lot of times on my social media, I'll just have my office handle the uh, messaging, so I don't even got to get involved in that. But I think accessibility is a bit of a problem. You can't make yourself that accessible. A lot, a lot of content creators, they'll exchange numbers, they'll go to each other's house, they build a friendship, which is great. Don't get me wrong, it's a nice thing. But to do that just based on what you see on the internet is a little, I don't know, it's a little rough to make that decision. You know, you want to kind of meet somebody. You want to feel them out. You want to get to know who they really are. Think about it, people. How many people have we seen on here come and go who said they were one thing and wind up being something totally else, right? So there's a lot of deceit. There's a lot of that. So I think you got to be cautious of that and you got to account for that when you're dealing with people. And you got to keep that in back of your mind that what they're telling you isn't the truth. You may be the type of person, everything I say is pretty much face value. I say what I feel, I feel what I say. Uh, don't get me wrong, I try to be particular with my words because I know the intentions of others, so I try to be very particular and very transparent and very crystal clear with my intentions when I speak. But the overall message is pretty much how I feel and what I want to say. Um, I may use colorful language, uh, in my personal life, when I'm talking about certain issues, uh, but I'm not going to use that in a public forum. It just doesn't, it's just not what I want to put out there. You know what I mean? It's not what my channel's for. I'm not knocking anybody who does that. Everybody has their own style. Just for me, and also there's different criteria for me. And what I mean by that is I'm more under a microscope because of nonsense and uh, because of other other things. 
So I have to really watch because I know uh, the intentions of those who maybe don't like what I'm doing or to try to derail what I'm doing. So you have to be conscious of that when you're navigating. You got to be conscious of possible intentions, what somebody's want, trying to have you do. Don't ever let anybody dictate your reaction. Okay, folks? I know it's hard sometimes not to get emotional, not to get pissed off, and not to react, but always look at it like I do. Don't let somebody dictate how you're going to react. If they're setting a trap for you, don't fall into the trap. Recognize the trap. Understand it and use it to your advantage. Use their bad intentions to your advantage. That's the best advice I could give you. And that's that's this whole YouTube circus and social media circus, everybody in different platforms, I'm sure they experienced their own thing. I was never heavy on Twitter, as I said earlier. I only use social media like really for business purposes and for the podcast. So I use Twitter, Instagram, all that, but I never used it personally. But you know, you get people, they get in these crazy Twitter wars. I mean, I was watching that dark side of comedy with Roseanne and when she was saying all those ridiculous, terrible racist stuff, you had to see the war she was getting into. You know, it's going to happen. That's how it goes. It gets nuts out there. And you're going to get some psychotic people who don't just leave it on the internet. And that's why it goes back to my prior point about maybe not wanting to put all your information out there because you do got the lunatics. Sometimes you'll be debating somebody and you think they're on the same page as you as far as, all right, we're just having an argument. We're going back and forth. No big deal. Once I log off, it's over. You have to realize some people aren't like that. They'll take it personally. They'll get upset if they feel they were embarrassed. You don't know what they're capable of. I never underestimate anybody in life. I think that's a big mistake a lot of people make. They underestimate people. Never underestimate anybody. When you underestimate somebody, you can make a mistake. You can make a mistake and you give them the advantage. If you don't underestimate them, you're always prepared. You'll have your your game on, so to speak. You know, you'll know every time you interact with them, you got to you got to be on point. And that's important. That's important. That'll protect you in a lot of ways. People don't see that. And, uh, wow, I'm going on 56 minutes here. I, wow, this was longer than I thought. This was a good session today, folks. I, I'm glad you stood by. I hope I didn't bore anybody. I hope some of what I said is relatable. Um, this was a good therapy session, actually. <laughs> it was nice to just talk about whatever popped in my head. I apologize if, uh, hold on, I'm taking another sip of coffee, which is cold now, but I don't mind it. But anyway, um, I, I hope uh, people enjoyed what I wanted to just kick around that popped in my head. I'm so, I apologize if I was all over the place. Sometimes I'll jump back and forth, just uh, how my brain works sometimes, it'll jump back and forth, so I hope I didn't... <laughs> give anybody a headache or confuse anybody but I think I was pretty clear with my points and what I was talking about and um, again nothing major here this wasn't really a big knowledge one this wasn't really an educational one it was just me connecting with the uh, listeners and talking about this whole YouTube experience talking about how the uh, guilt for the guiltless book came to be and things of that nature so I should be putting out another episode soon. I got a few ideas on what I want to cover. Um, there's, a, there's a few more informants on the scene. So uh, I'm going to be looking into them as well. I want to. I got my office pulling some case records on some of the new informants that I'm just not familiar with. I wasn't really aware of them. So I want to just get familiar with the case, with the testimony. People don't realize it takes time to really look into... Uh, whether it's an informant or a defendant, whatever it may be, if you want to do it the right way, you got to do a lot of research. I like to go to newspaper articles just to paint uh, the direction in which I'm going because as we know with the media, you got to be careful what you believe. So it just kind of outlines the general basis of stories. Then I'll go to the pacer. Then I'll reach out to um, different defense attorneys who may have had to face those various informants, try to get all that information. You just want to get a real good clear picture whenever you're investigating something or looking into something because I'd like to cover a lot of these different informants that are coming out um, a while ago I spoke about it I requested I had to get it from the archives the minutes for a trial that happened like 20 years ago for an informant who's currently on doing a podcast so I'm still waiting for that everything's a project I don't know why that's taking so long uh, and it wasn't cheap either I don't know why it's taking so long but hopefully I get that 
my plan is to read from that. The other thing I'm actually working on, um, I had somebody similar to to what happened with Lisa years ago. I had somebody reach out to me. They were interested in uh, uh, they were interested actually in writing about after the trial to what goes on with the appeal. So there may be a guilt for the guiltless too. Uh, I haven't decided yet to be honest with you because uh, just uh, because of personal reasons and how things may have developed recently. So I haven't decided what I'm going to do with that. But I found that interesting. It may be something good to do. The other option I was thinking is if I don't have this uh, lady write it, I may just, um, you know, if she doesn't want to write it, again, similar situation, asking for information, wants to know if I'd be interested in helping her put it together. But I don't know if I'm going to do that. What I may just do is do my own type of book, quote unquote, where I may just put a full document together of how everything played out after after the conviction, what took place after the conviction. I put the court records, I put the minutes. So I'm thinking about that as well. I may do a project like that. Um, it would be, uh, you know, like a guilt for the guiltless, I'd call it guilt for the guiltless after trial or after the conviction, something like that. So I haven't decided if I'm going to work with it on this individual who reached out to me or it's something I'm going to put together myself just to put all the documents out there for people who are interested to read. So those are things I'm, I'm kicking around. Another project I want to kick around is I really like the way that guy did the audio book. So what I may do is when I pull a lot of these transcripts, I like that concept. I think that'll really engage the listeners of somebody reading the court transcripts. So my, my idea is I want to get certain cases with these lying informants and where they were exposed on the stand for their lying. And I'd like to have two voice actors, one do the part of, or maybe three voice actors. You have somebody do the part of the prosecution, somebody do the part of the defense, and somebody do the part of the informant. And I won't do zero commentary. I'll just have them read the transcripts and almost do a playlist with all the different cases having transcripts read. read. So you could get an idea of the informant, the idea of the case. I think that'll be interesting. It could be like a weekly thing or a monthly thing, but I think that'll be interesting. People just to sit back and hear live courtroom proceedings play out. So I have a lot of ideas for the channel, a lot of different things I'm going to do. Again, people, it's a matter of time. Um, I, I own a couple businesses, so I'm quite busy. I have a family, I'm busy. But these are all things I'm definitely going to do. Again, it's a, uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. I just take my time. I always remember the saying, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So anything you're trying to accomplish, you just do it little by little. It's about consistency. And that's another thing. That's a huge trait for mine. Who's consistent? I've seen so many people come out of the gate all fired up. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. We're going to work on this. I'm going to start a website that does that. And then like two, three months go by and everything's done. Website's down. <laughs> they gave up. So it's really important when you work with somebody, you build a relationship, or you're working on a project. You want to have solid people who are consistent. People who aren't going to give up, who aren't going to throw the ball in when they, when they uh, uh, face adversity or face obstacles. And that's the key. And that's one thing I always teach my, my kids. You can't give up. You start something, you don't quit it. I don't care what it is. Even when they were little, they would start like, say, Little League or whatever, maybe soccer. I just tell them, if you're signing up, you cannot quit. You got to at least play the season. You, you can't just quit midstream like that. I don't like that. Now, if after the end, you decide you don't like the sport, I'm not the type of father who's going to force my kid to do something he don't like. But you got to, if you commit to it, you got to write it out. You got to write it out. That's how I feel. That's how I've always been. And um, I notice a lot of people don't like that. So when you're building something, you, you want to make sure you have a solid team who, who has longevity, has conviction, and is consistent. That's the key for success in a lot of ways, regardless of what you're look, working on. And I think I uh, bored you guys long enough for today. I think I spoke about everything I wanted to talk about. Till next time, folks. 
You've been listening to the Justice Tech Pros podcast with Dominic Crea, one of the most unique podcasts on the internet, discussing the obstacles the defense team faces when trying a case, what goes on behind the scenes during pretrial and motion phase, holding defense attorneys accountable, making sure they're fighting for their clients, the difference between textbook law and how things truly play out in a courtroom, and everything in between. And everything in between. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show and we'll be back soon until then find us on twitter facebook and instagram at justice tech pros to email the show with questions and comments it's podcast at justice tech pros.com till next time this is justice tech pros podcast and dominic crea signing off <laughs>